This is the WGNS Action Line, talking with Rutherford County newsmakers about what matters most to you. Now, your host, Scott Walker. In studio with us today, we have Robin Blackman, Wilma McLean, and Mary Watkins. And we're talking a little bit about the M section at the Evergreen Cemetery. And we'll also be talking about the 10th anniversary Lighting the Way celebration, all part of the African American Historical Society. And uh, what should we start out with first? Robin? Good morning, everyone. We'll start out with the 10 year anniversary. We will be celebrating 10 years on November 9th, that's Saturday, November 9th at 7 p.m. at the MTSU Student Union Building Ballroom. We will have a dinner theater and a silent auction. You may get tickets for $65 for adults, $30 for 22 and under. Uh, During this event, we will be highlighting uh, three of our young, young folks here from who are native uh, Rutherford Countyans who we are going to celebrate. We will have Dr. Rayshawn Ray, Miss Dekalia Dayday Wells, and Mr. Craig Watkins will all be recognized during this event as well. There are opportunities for sponsorships. We would love for you to sponsor. Uh, There's four opportunities for sponsorships and also you may purchase ads. If you would, please go out to our Facebook page and you will be able to find a QR code where you can go in and get your tickets or sponsorships. So on Facebook, what should they type in to find out more information? Facebook, we are African American Hair Society of Redford County, and uh, there will be a picture of, I think it's three females and two males, so you know you have the right page. Easy enough there. Tell us a little bit more about what these 10 years of history going back uh, really means for Rutherford County. For the 10 years for Rutherford County, it means that the history that was hidden is now come to the surface. And when I say hidden, because nobody really talked about it, but we have been uh, digging and we have found quite a few people who are from Redford County have made a difference in other people's lives along with their own. For instance, we have found that, oh, I can't think of her name right now, Kelly House, that was her name. She was the first person to try to get reparations for former slaves. She traveled the South trying to set up societies. She didn't get paid for any of this. She just wanted these people to have, when they die, have someone to care about their bodies and intern them in a dignified manner. Have you been surprised at any of the history that you've been able to uncover? I have been surprised. (laughs) Yes, and so have I. You know, uh, in terms, I think in terms of Sam Keeble, you know, he was the first African-American to serve in the state as representative for the state, uh, African-American. And we did not know that. He was born in Rutherford County off of Jefferson Park in Smyrna area, I would say, on the Keeble Plantation, you know, or whatever. He worked for uh, newspapers here, the uh, Telegraph here. And then he moved to Nashville. And uh, I did not know that until, I guess, in uh, uh, 2020 something, we went to see the Robinson Plantation there in um, Springfield. And they had that at the Tennessee uh, Tennessee Library and Archives. And we just happened to go in and visit. And there he was. And we were just so amazed because we wasn't taught that in school, that he was from Rutherford County. So we're finding things like that or whatever. So it's just so surprising to us. And we did a hidden figure calendar of a lot of you know of people in Rutherford County who shows that we are standing on, and we did not have a clue until we started this organization. It's really interesting being able to uncover, you know, go back and look into history, but actually uncover things that other folks didn't know about, mm-hmm. and, and then figure out ways to implement that information into maybe local museums, maybe mm-hmm. at Oakland's Mansion or the Civil War Battle Park. Mm-hmm. H- have you been able to implement anything that you've found? yet into some of these local places? At the courthouse, we have uncovered so much. Mary Allen Vaughn is one that's there at the courthouse in the museum. Okay, well, this other lady, she was a singer, and she could pass, uh, what we say, pass for white, but the thing is, she didn't. And she taught music to others, and she was affiliated with Fisk University, I do believe. But... I was surprised on that because most of the time when a person had the opportunity to pass for white to make their life a little easier, they did it, but she chose not to. She wanted to continue on the way she was. Do you think you'll uncover even more things as time goes on? 
Oh, most definitely. What, History what, is there. <laughs> what are some of the other things you're working on right now? Well, see, working on right now, uh, we just finished not too long ago Section M of the cemetery on Greenland Drive, Evergreen. If I re- remember my history correctly, I think it started out as a slave cemetery, and they were all in Section M. And then over the years, it was where the African Americans were interned during, let me see, back when the 50s, 60s. Before desegregation, yeah. they were able, uh, African Americans had to be buried in that M section. That was the only place that they were allowed to be buried. So like she was saying, we put that marker there to honor those African Americans that was buried there without headstones, which there is a plenty. And uh, I'll be talking about Apple John when I did a research on him, found out he was buried there, but they don't have headstones. So we want to honor those people as long as, like what she said, most likely that's where the enslaved from the Oakland Mansion was buried too. Yeah, from what I understand, that property used to belong to Oakland's Mansion, and yes. I guess they, one of the families, turned it over to the city at one point or another. That's right. And then eventually it became Evergreen Cemetery. Mm-hmm. So there in that cemetery, have you been able to figure out every name who was buried there in that M section yet? Uh, no, we have not. Uh, we have a few now. We did get a, a register from evergreen and they do have some names listed the main thing with us we don't know where you could see the indents there in the cemetery and uh, miss brewer did tell us that they do not disturb that property because they know people are there even though we don't know where who's in those graves and mtsu have been out there and did the uh, some little research with their machine and everything to to do the ground penetration and we can see where people are but you know not knowing who people are but that's the reason why we wanted to honor those people by putting that monument even though the names are not and hopefully someday we will be able to add some names on that things were so different back then yes. and fewer records were kept even mm-hmm. i mean there was just a lot less done in order just to keep track of families and life there that's was right. a lot less done that's right but going forward when you go back and try to examine to figure out you know who was here are you contacting some of the original families or descendants of the original families? Uh, not at this not at this point. We have not tried to contact people. Like I said, we have a list of uh, some people that are there, and uh, some do have headstones. Of course, the, the scales, the uh, senior, not the, the recent one, but uh, Mr. Preston Scales and his wife, they're there. There are several. Uh, Miss Kilgo Film Home, uh, they used to own the film, uh, film home. She's there, but some of them are blessed to have markers, but it's so many more that do not. It's more do not have had you know stones than the ones that do but i tell you an interesting story that happened to me probably about three years ago a young man was stationed his parents were stationed at stewart's air force base and this is reason why it is so important that we do that uh he contacted stones river national battlefield and they in in terms had them to call me and he called me and his his uh this young man called me say i'm in from california and uh i'm here for a family reunion and my brother was buried here back in the 60s and we're trying to find him and so my father said you're probably not going to be able to find him because he didn't even know where so anyway he called me and so I pulled out my little list and I said you know what is his name and he told me I said yes he was buried out here so me and uh, him and his wife and my sister and stuff we went out there and we just split up and just walked the area to see if we could find him and really and true he found his brother that was buried there. I don't forget, he was like six months old or something like that, and he just broke down and cried. So this is the kind of things that's so important, and it have happened more than once where people have called, even at the Benevolent Cemetery, asking us, you know, I tried to find my relative, I can't find him. I know they were buried here, and once they cleaned it off, we was able to find his uh, his uh, parents where they were buried there in the cemetery. So that's the reason why it's so important, and we are going around and uh, look, finding African American cemeteries, because a lot of them are not recorded, and we are documenting those inhabitants in the cemetery, because we feel like that's in 
important. We're doing a database and uh, and everything. Hopefully, down the road, we're planning on putting a book together with the African American cemeteries in it, so people will be able to locate their relatives uh, when they are, you know, in search trying to find them. Uh, are there that many uh, African American cemeteries in Rutherford County that folks don't know about? Yes, there's a lot of them. And the thing about it, what we found out too, uh, you know, when the cemetery, when people stop burying there, they tend to be, be dis, uh, di, uh, not taken care of and uh, and everything. And sometimes, you know, the younger generation, you know, they're long forgotten until we start doing some research and we find out they were buried in this cemetery. Okay, we want to know where is this cemetery uh, or whatever. And we also work with John at the uh, Rutherford County Archives with him on the cemeteries. We've turned in some names to him that he don't even have and, uh, and everything. So, and a lot of times back in the day, uh, African Americans, you know, you buried them on your land, not on to us it happened for all races like that and uh, and everything and, and a lot of time that land is sold off if it's not recorded on the deed you know people lose those and uh, and everything we've gone into some where we've just had to just walk through all kind of branches and stuff and we try to do it when all the vegetation have died down uh, or whatever and a lot of them still don't have headstones we've seen where they just all sunk and you may have a few there and everything and then we go back and try to research to see because a lot of times if you do recognize some if they have the headstones you're going to find other family members because usually they bear them together or whatever so you know I think the recent flooding we had had in uh, not only East Tennessee, but of course, North Carolina, South Carolina, those areas, I, I think that made this type of information all the more important mm-hmm. because you had some cemeteries that people never expected to mm-hmm. flood all That's of a sudden right. flood. And you had uh, some of the coffins even washed to another location yeah. and then what do you do because you don't know who originally was there if you don't have a list and it's it's not just a local thing uh a pbs did a, a thing on the tennessee H- uh, historical cemeteries uh back in uh february and i think it was may when they actually did the documentary and uh benevolent cemetery one of those and they went all over tennessee finding those historical african-american cemeteries so it's just not here and they were t- a lot of them was talking about how they are uncovering those cemeteries and uh, cleaning them off and giving honor to those people that was buried there. So it's a, it's not just a local thing. It's sort of a national thing. Now, what I found really interesting was that you mentioned some of these cemeteries, they were not even marked on the deed. Mm-hmm. So it, people didn't even know if they bought the land, maybe even at auction. Mm-hmm. They didn't know the cemetery even existed. Mm-hmm. That is so true. And... Uh, and a lot of them are being disturbed. I mean, we can even look at the one out there where Costco was. You know, they were digging out there, and they had to stop that because there was graves out there. No, where, um, where was that one? I, I'm trying to picture. On Costco's uh, out here, the big uh, Salem. Right. Mm-hmm. Off oh, of Salem. Salem Pike. So it was right off of and Salem Pike. Bur- burrows. I know some of the burrows was buried there because come to find out, that was one thing, you know, I think Wilma and another uh, uh, person within our organization went out there and everything, and they found out that this William Burroughs owned this. And uh, he had some uh, uh, children, uh, or whatever that was African American. They were, of course, now we call them biracial. And they were some. Of the, they was two. Uh, his children. They were the first uh, African. Uh, people from Rutherford County to attend Fisk University. Mm-hmm. And we did research that and find that out. So have you been able to to kind of bring new life to that cemetery? You maybe clear some of the debris? And if so, where, uh, where is it out there if you're looking at Costco? Okay, they had to stop that. And I went out there, uh, Wilma, several of us went with John from the archives, and we walked out there. And what they've done, in cases like that, a lot of times they will move those bodies and put them at another place so they have a headstone some out there we did go and we saw it where they uh have put to honor those people or whatever even though you know i'm sure they didn't get they didn't move all of them they just have something to honor those people that was there there and on that uh, place there but it's happening a lot you know when interest is coming in and they it's, it's a lot of them disturbing those that's why it's important that we do record these cemeteries and these people that and uh ones that are buried there because interesting you know you can't stop progress but a lot of those great people they, they are being disturbed because of that hey, i guess in some cases 
progress is good because you may not have even known this was there mm-hmm. had it not have been for that progress. That's right. That's true. So whenever you find a cemetery, do you go to the Register of Deeds office and, and let them know the location so that they can put something down? How do you, what do you do first? Well, what we have done in the past, and I know uh, I've talked to, I think it was uh, Mr. James Gucci, go around, do cemeteries and stuff, clean them off. Matter of fact, he made some pathways for us to be able to get to some, and he had suggests for us for us to turn around and just make some little signs say it is a cemetery and have it put there so people won't say well we didn't know that there was a cemetery you know there and even myself I, where I live you know my mom showed us said do not disturb this because there's a cemetery there and, but we have not put a mark and I keep telling my sibling we need to do it because we are up in the age and the next generation is not going to know that uh, her family was buried there and everything so she's always just said do not disturb this and it's happening to a lot of other places where I've researched some families out there in Walt Hill where I live and I found where it said that these people were buried on the home place and uh, and everything. And then on one out there, I know where uh, my family married, my uh, father, ma- uh, sibling married into this family. Now, they have it blocked off, and it is on the, de- the records, but it do not have headstones. We've gone there, it's blocked off, and it is on there. But you're going to find a lot of them, it's just not listed. Is it common or was it common back then to not have headstones? I think it more so said common is that people couldn't afford them. Now, some we have found where they just have these triangle rocks. They have a triangle, and once upon a time, they may have scratched on those rocks, but that deteriorates. But the rocks are still there with no names on them. It's sad to think about. Yes, it, it, it is. I, I'm curious, what is the earliest date that you have found so far? I, I think it was back, I guess, around about the mid 1800s is about the earliest that we find. And I'm speaking in terms even with our own cemetery and back uh, our church cemetery. And a lot of them we have, I would say, in the mid or late uh, 1800s. Were most of the people that you do find in these cemeteries, were they from Rutherford County or did they come from another area? Uh, most of them that I, we found, they are from Rutherford County. Their families are from here. Wow. So a lot of these folks, they probably do have ancestors who are still living here today. Mm-hmm. For sure. That, that's wild. And some of them I've recognized that they are, you know. It, it, it is interesting to uncover and, and look back and kind of record these names as mm-hmm. you f- find the names. Mm-hmm. Um, but how many names total have you found so far? Ooh, cool. It's quite a bit. <laughs> we, yeah. it's, it's quite it's quite a bit. You know, yeah. even with Benevolent Cemetery, you know, out there off of Church Street. Uh, gosh, that, that's eight acres, and I think they've been buried on about 400 acres of them. And I think right now, I think it's what about 1,600 or so that we have uncovered, but a lot of them do not have headstones. Stones. Again, this morning we're talking with the African American Historical Society of Rutherford County and our guest today, Mary Watkins, Wilma McLean, and Robin Blackman. So when you look at that benevolent cemetery, I, I think that got a lot of publicity maybe just, what, 10 years or so ago when people really started talking about the need to, to fix it up, to clean off the space. Uh, but it did get a lot of attention. Uh, yes, and there has been a lot of work uh, done on that when we first went out there uh, that was a like I say was a benevolent cemetery it was African Americans formed this to take care of their people and uh, and everything to make sure they had a place to be buried and also they took care of the sick and everything so when that last person that died that was a member of that cemetery they turned it over to Allen Chapel here in Murfreesboro and it's a lot of work for uh, you think in terms of that type of cemetery for a church to handle but they decided decided to take it because that lady left it to them and it's been really hard for them to maintain it but they have the last few years they have really done well the the first time we went out there they was trying to cut down clean it off and everything and the saws were breaking I said y'all just we just about was to turn around and just maybe just get all the underbrush but a few people are deacons there at trustees at Allen Chapel they really they went in and cleaned it off so they trying to keep it uh, clean but there's a a lot of headstones that have been uh, have fallen over 
And the thing about it is the homeless people were staying there and they got them off. And then when we st they started cleaning it off, people started realizing that and some of the headstones was destroyed in intentionally was knocked down. Uh, so that's with first the African American Hair Society. We do have a Tennessee historical marker there honoring that and Dr. Van West from MTSU have got it on the National Register and uh, and everything. And we are 501 C3. So that is what we are researching trying to get uh, a grant and that's going to be the first thing we really want to restore that cemetery because it is a historic Historical Cemetery, and a lot of our families are buried there. They haven't buried there, I don't think, since around about 2002 and everything, but uh, uh, we just really have got to get that um, cemetery restored. And for that in particular, that, that particular cemetery, you had homeless folks who they actually had their tents on top of some of those yes, grave markers. Yes. They did. And even after they cleaned it off, you know, some of them still sort of stayed there, but they had to get the police. They had to remove them and everything. So now they pretty much under that underpath. They stay under there, whatever. Yeah, they, I mean, they just was living there, you know, but again, you look at it, you know, you say, wow, they living in the cemetery, but those people don't bother you, though. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what I tell people, you know, when I go in, you know, they look at me, you know, going to these cemeteries and stuff. I said, oh, the people are deceased. They're not going to bother you. You know, it, <laughs> it's kind of like if you look at a cemetery where they are still Still burying folks uh, like let's say the evergreen you, you wouldn't go there and set up a tent oh that's true but because this one was kind of overgrown and yes people didn't think about it much these folks were out there setting mm -hmm. up tents on mm -hmm. it i mean it's just it's a lot to to imagine yes now if you go out there now and just imagine what it was of several years ago and see it now i tell you a blessing have really taken place because it's totally different it, it is a big difference now when that cemetery first opened was it larger in size was there once more land that was part of that cemetery no eight acres and they bought that from albert miller that uh, back there in the uh, 80s, uh, 18, uh, 1800s, uh, Abbott Miller, the, the property where the um, post office is, the Millers owned that. And that's where that land came off of that. They so, He sold eight acres to that organization. Now, I know there is a road that goes up the center of that, like a, a gravel drive almost. Are there graves on either side, on both sides of that? Probably so. And we also thinking where those uh, factories are that doesn't sort of infringe on it because some of the uh, the graves you can see is right on that line and everything. And uh, I've used I, when they were burying there, I've been there f several times or whatever. But what happened? Uh, a lot of people don't even know how to get to it because that railroad track. We used to go off of the across the railroad track, uh, but someone was killed on that track. So then the city or whoever, they decided to close that entrance there. So now you have to go down, go down Park Avenue and go around and go through where all those uh, factories and stuff is uh, and go around to that and get, go into the, the cemetery. And again, this morning, we're talking about the African American Historical Society, and we're joined by Mary Watkins, Wilma McLean, and Robin Blackman. We're going to take a short break, and then we will be right back. So make sure you stay with us. Time again right now, 842. If you're planning an upcoming trip and want to include your pet, we have all the travel supplies you'll need at Animal City. This is Amanda at Animal City, inviting your family to come do business with my family. Animal City is Murfreesboro's hometown, family-owned pet store. We've had the honor and pleasure of serving the community for 33 years. If you want to see some photos of our adorable pets, feel free to check out our Facebook page, Animal City of Murfreesboro, Tennessee. We're at 919 Northwest Broad Street, right here in Murfreesboro. Those affected by Hurricane Helene urgently need you. A donation to the American Red Cross provides meals, shelter, and hope. Join WGNS and Old South, Tennessee's favorite home builder, to have an even greater impact. For every dollar donated at WGNSRadio.com, Old South will match it up to $25,000. Go to WGNSRadio.com and tap the secure link, and with your help, we can make a difference. WGNSRadio.com, make your donations directly to the American Red Cross Helene Relief Efforts. We're excited to announce that Capstar Bank is now officially a division of Old National Bank. All those friends you've made while banking here over the years, well, they're still there. And so are the delicious, warm, homemade cookies. In Murfreesboro at 2230 Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. Everything you enjoyed at Capstar, still there at Old National Bank. 
Old National Bank, ready to serve you. Old National Bank, member FDIC, equal housing lender. The Action Line on FM 101.9 and AM 1450 Murfreesboro, FM 100.5 Smyrna. Listen and watch at WGNSRadio.com. This morning, we're joined by the African-American Historical Society of Rutherford County and our guests today, Robin Blackman, Wilma McLean, and Mary Watkins. So, Robin, going back to you, this event coming up November 9th, and it's called Lighting the Way, but tell us more about it. Okay, so our event is a celebration for 10 years. Um, And Lighting the Way, this theme, it captures the idea of the society leading the way and serving as a guiding light through their work in discovering, preserving, teaching, and sharing the African-American heritage and history of Rutherford County. The theme actually emphasizes the society's role as a beacon, illuminating and preserving the important history and heritage of the African-American community in Rutherford County over the past decade. Um, It conveys a sense of momentum, progress, and continued dedication to the mission. One of our goals is to take this work and share it with not only the community, but specifically the young people, because we want them to know their history. Um, It's not just our history, it's their history as well. Our event is gonna take place again on the campus of Middle Tennessee State University on Saturday, November 9th, 7 p.m. We will also have a play that was written by our very own Mary Watkins. And I just want to say Mary was the president of the organization for 10 years. She has been our president for 10 years. She is now President Emerita. Uh, We have a new president. We just installed uh, Billy McKinley, who's not here with us today. But she has written a play because she is a local playwright here in Rutherford County. And the name of the play is Boss Man Coming. So not only will you have dinner, but you'll also get to be a part of this play um, and this experience. You'll get to experience this play as well as we have some other things that we're going to do as well to highlight some things that have happened within the organization over the last 10 years. So we are very excited. Again, as I said, you can go out to our Facebook page and you can find the QR code and get more information. We would love to have you join us. We're looking for sponsors. We're looking for people who want to place ads or maybe just want to be a patron and support um, this nonprofit um, that is solely really devoted to giving back to the community because that's what we've been doing with our markers and with our research. Um, We also want to mention a little bit about the uh, one of our big projects that we had during the 10 years was our calendars. We've done, I think Mary mentioned the hidden figures, but we also did a calendar that highlighted uh, 36 churches, African-American churches that were at least 100 years old. And so that was a calendar that we had several years ago. And we still have this research. We've talked about this before. We have quite a bit of research, and I'll mention that Dr. Smith, Dr. George Smith, who was one of our founders, uh, who kind of spearheaded a lot of this research on the churches. Uh, We have research there that we have other things that we're going to uncover and share regarding those churches. Anything else on the churches, Mary? Uh, We have, uh, with those churches, the 36 right now, we have five that have Tennessee historical markers uh, there because, uh, you know, they did not have that uh, there before. And matter of fact, when we start putting up these Tennessee historical markers of African-American community, that was only one, and that was at Bradley Academy Museum. So that was one way we wanted to bring our history to light, but putting up these historical markers, plus putting up uh, my monuments and if you can go if you've been down through the cemetery community down there off of uh, old nashville highway we have three monuments there one at the old cemetery uh the cemetery school uh stones river united methodist church and uh ebenezer's ebenezer primitive baptist church they all have the same type of monument there as well as the one that's in the uh m section of the uh Evergreen Cemetery. Now, have you found with these churches, the 36 churches, 100 plus years old, have they kept good history records over the years? Uh, Yes, and we do have uh, the history of those churches, and that was another thing, not only just identifying them, we've gotten their history, and we are uh, going to eventually do a book 
with all those churches that are 100 years old. And, we, and when we started this, we didn't even realize that that was that many that was 100 plus. And not only that, how many African-American churches are in Rutherford County. And I think the last count that we had was about 70 over this, uh, uh, within Rutherford County. Some of them are very small uh, or whatever, but uh, we were just so surprised at, that those churches have existed. And if you think about the African Americans back in the day, and a lot of them started around, some of them uh, as early as uh, 1863. I know our church was 1875 and everything uh, or whatever. And we just felt like it's just so important. We want the young people to see the shows that they're standing on because that was really the only institution after slavery that the African Americans actually owned. So these it was the church. They were the bedrock of our community. And these 36 churches, are those 36 churches, are those African American churches, all 36? Yes. yes. And to date, I think uh, there are about 34 still exist. Mm -hmm. Well, what's fascinating even more is that back then, a hundred years ago, our population was tiny compared mm -hmm. to today. And I guess I didn't even realize we had 36 churches a hundred years ago in Rutherford County. Yes. Because we were so much smaller. Well, see, that's what the, you know, the African-Americans, that's what they had. They stood on that and they believed, you know, even in spite of what they go they were going through, the Lord was going to sustain them and whatever. So where they were, that's where they were meeting and that's where they build their churches. And if you look at it and with us, the history that we've done out of those churches, that's where the schools evolved from. A lot of them helped their uh, started their schools within the church, and then once that they build the schools adjacent to the churches. So you know, or whatever. So the churches have really played a very uh, important role in the African American community, and still do to this day. And, and also, the churches was where they socialized mm -hmm. because they worked all week long, and Sundays was their day of rest, and it was the time for them to be able to see their friends. And and their family where they're not rushing to do something else. It was their social time. And out of that, we also had the Rosenwald Schools. We had another calendar, and it kind of came after we did the research with the churches because the Rosenwald Schools came out of that. And Mary, how many Rosenwald Schools? Uh, 14. Rosenwald Schools that mm -hmm. came, and they were all affiliated with churches, with that's the African-American churches. And that's where many of the African-Americans were educated mm -hmm. early on was through the Rosenwald schools. And myself, I attended three of them, of the Rosenwald schools. My parents were sharecroppers, so we sort of moved around within the area. So I did attend three of those. And, and what did work look like a hundred years ago for those who attended these churches? Their day-to-day -day life, what did they do for a living, most of them? Uh, they were sharecroppers. So that was the main thing back then. Right. Right after, you know, Reconstruction, you know, after slavery was over with, uh, they stayed within close proximity. So they went from being enslaved to being tenders, and they stayed within that area where they, you know, where they were freed. You know, you have a few, few people that moved around, but very few. Most of them stayed within that area. And um, I would imagine whatever. those who did move away, they're, their main part you know their main family was probably elsewhere and they probably mm -hmm. came here uh, at some point later in life for them right right so things were a lot different back then it was really different and and you know we're standing on these sh the shoulders of those people and that's why we are really so involved in uh our history and everything because it's not about us and we want the young people today to see whose shoulders they are standing on you know or whatever things are not just the way it is today just because of it's because so many people have sacrificed so much for them to be able to enjoy life today and we want them to understand that I, I'm going to guess that the average middle schooler or high schooler in Rutherford County has no clue about Have any of this history. Mm -hmm. And it's, the thing about it is that a lot of it, you know, I don't want to get into too much, you know, where a lot of it is trying to be removed, but history is history. It's what it is, and we cannot change that. 
it, it's got to be taught, though, at it some point in further detail. It has to be. And we have offered through our educational presentations opportunities. And what we're trying to do is take this out to the community. And typically we get maybe a church to host or we've hosted uh, Patterson. We've had some events over at Patterson um, Center, Patterson Park Center, um, Community Center, to try and take this message out to the community and create an opportunity to have dialogue with the younger generation so they can ask the questions and they can just learn about their history. What is the biggest fear that you're up against when you know you go to a school and say we would really like to present this uh, at some point in the near future and then they say to you no we don't want to do that. What's the biggest fear they raise? They're, they're and it has been because uh, I know I have uh, brought that uh, out to try to see if we could. Uh, everything has to be censored now. Uh, I was told, you know, uh, we can meet later on and see what, you know, the organization about, see what you're trying to do and all that kind of stuff. Then we can let you know whether or not you can go into the schools to do this. Uh, when I was teaching at Riverdale, we would have black history uh, when that, during Black History Month, we will put up bulletin boards. We will uh, have a uh, uh, lot of things, you know, uh, about African Americans who have patented certain things. We will bring that to the forefront for the uh, students to see that. And we will also talk about local people and everything. But I was asking somebody not too long ago that a lot of that do not exist now. No, it's more International Month instead of Black History Month. I, I wonder why. I, I mean, because it doesn't make sense to me because it seems like the most important thing should be local, local history. Yes. Well, I can't figure out why they want to change it, but that's the way yeah. it is. My uh, husband, we went to exhibit one night at, during Black History Month, and they call it International Month. Mm -hmm. I've never even heard that. Mm -hmm. yeah. That That's crazy. Yeah. So what do you do moving forward to change that is it just more more events like the one coming up at mtsu yes we're just going to keep doing you know and try to set up uh programs uh, uh do presentation to invite people to come in and just talk about it i mean we have to do it you know like i said certain things are changing you know we can change history it's there uh or whatever and we're not doing it to make it as a stumbling block we just want people to understand whose shoulders they're st standing on and hopefully it make a difference in people's lives yes. and i and i think also through our partnerships mm -hmm. we have partnerships with uh, oakland's mansion we yes. have partnerships with the stones river national battlefield mm -hmm. and so we've done some had some programs there and i think that is i mean that's a small step but I do think it's the right step. It's a yes. step in the right direction to try and get the word out to the community, not just the African-American community, but to the Rutherford County community. Yes. If somebody listening, let's say their husband, their wife teaches history at one of the local schools and they say, you know, I would love to see this happen. I would love to have you guys come out and speak before our class. How can they go about contacting somebody at the group or, or is there a phone number they can call mm -hmm. well they can yes. contact us through our facebook page mm -hmm. uh phone number i'm not sure billy's what? phone number is there mine may also still yeah. be there you know they can go in they can contact us they can send us an email or text or whatever mm -hmm. and we will be glad to go in and share some you know information with them if they would like for us to do that so on facebook look for african-american historical society of rutherford yes. county contact heritage. information heritage. So heritage heritage add heritage to that too mm -hmm. uh, but that should be where contact information mm -hmm. is or you could just send a message through the facebook page mm -hmm. right. we also have a website okay. um it is a a h s o f r c so a h s of rc dot org and there's a place there where you can actually put a contact we have people that contact us all the time through the website you can go in and contact and leave a message and we will get back with you sounds great we'll post all of this with this podcast when we post it in just a little while but uh thank you all for joining us thank you thank you for having us definitely again with us today robin blackman wilma mclean and mary watkins of the african-american historical society of rutherford county and uh, stay with us we do have a Local news coming your way next. Bye. 
The Action Line on FM 101.9 and AM 1450 Murfreesboro, FM 100.5 Smyrna. Listen and watch at WGNSRadio.com. 